Welcome to another episode of Sideline Sanity with me, Michelle Tafoya. We'd love it if you'd subscribe, listen to all of our episodes, never miss an episode, just push that subscribe button. Today, we are talking to someone from Chicago. And why are we doing that? A couple reasons. Chicago just went under this mayoral election. And you may have heard that Lori Lightfoot did not win re-election. I think it was the first time in 40 years that an existing mayor did not get re-elected. She says it's because she's a black woman in America. So when she got elected, was she still a black woman in America? I think so. I don't think that's changed. So it didn't hurt her when she got elected, but now that she's not elected, it did hurt her. We all can see through that But Chicago politics is really interesting. It affects the entire state of Illinois, and it can serve as sort of a blueprint for every other really liberal city and state in America. So Miley Smith is with the Illinois Illinois Policy Institute. She is the senior director of labor policy, and she's a staff attorney, and she's really smart. And she's going to tell us what's going on in Illinois. Are there signs that should be making us hopeful? about the way people see politics in their communities? Are there signs that education is going to improve? Because it really can't get any worse in Chicago and Illinois than it already is. What makes her work? What makes her optimistic? And why should you feel inspired by this? That is next. For nearly three decades, she's reported the action from the sidelines. She started very young. She's covered the NBA, NFL, Olympics, and the college football and basketball national championships. And now, during these insane times in our world, Michelle Tafoya thinks we need a serious dose of sanity. This is Sideline Sanity with your host, one of the sanest people on planet Earth, Michelle Tafoya. May Lee, I've got to let my audience into this. You told me before we started this interview that your parents were watching the Johnny Carson show and they saw a participant right. doing Stump the Band and that part- an audience member and their name was May Lee and, and they named you for not after that person, but they liked the name. They liked Right. That's right. They liked that name. And unfortunately, I've never been to Hawaii. It it needs to be like at the top of my bucket list. Yeah, it really does. (laughs) When you get there, you know, see if you can find other Maylees. It's just adorable. I love the name. The the movie Blue Hawaii, Elvis. Elvis talks to Miley in the Blue Hawaii. Oh, is it Miley? Miley. Uh, I've been saying it Maylee and I'm wrong. So Miley. Okay. Like Miley Cyrus. Well, there you go. But you spell it in a way that it's Miley. You had it yeah, first. Really yes, cool. you did. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, now I stand corrected. Miley, thank you for being with us. It, it, this timing couldn't be better. Lori Lightfoot was just ousted as the mayor of Chicago. And I realize you're you're a statewide entity that you are interested in all of Illinois. But Chicago is a massive part of the political yes. scene there. And, and, and you know, I, I couldn't believe that this woman, this woman who is black, who also is a lesbian, was elected in the United States of America, but she blamed being unelected (laughs) on being black and female in America. This is identity politics at its finest. How much of this is going on throughout Illinois? It it really had nothing to do with identity politics in terms of ouster. We did a poll before the election to identify what Chicagoans were most concerned about. And by far, it was crime. 71% identified crime as their number one issue, followed by taxes. And when you look at Chicago, that is what is going on. It's crime and high taxes. Uh, Crime has increased, driven mainly by theft, by um, carjackings. The number of carjackings has soared. Um, And taxes, you know, we have the second highest property taxes in the nation. Chicago has a number of extra taxes like a 911 surcharge, ride sharing and home sharing fees, an amusement tax, a soft drink tax. So these are the things that are pummeling Chicagoans between crime and the high taxes. And that was their number one concern. This really was a referendum on Lori Lightfoot. And the people spoke that they were tired 
tired of the crime. They want to see something different happen. They want to see something different happen with their taxes. Well, what's interesting in that old adage, be careful what you wish for, the two uh, people in the runoff, how confident are you that either one of them can resolve the issues facing Chicago? So that's a fantastic question. And they are diametrically opposed in their approaches to those things that Chicagoans care most about. So on crime, um, Paul Vallis and Brandon Johnson are the two that will be in the runoff election. Vallis, he stands, he's actually endorsed by the Fraternal Order of Police in Chicago. Um, he wants to see officer staffing increased by 1800. He wants to increase the beat cop presence. On the other hand, Brandon Johnson, completely different end of the spectrum. He is on record for being in favor of defunding the police. He's on the record by saying he would want to cut the police budget by 150 million. Education is another very popular issue with Chicagoans. Um, Paul Vallis is in favor of school choice. In fact, he said he is um, in favor of 100% choice in education for parents. Brandon Johnson, on the other hand, is a CTU operative, Chicago Teachers Union operative. They really are responsible for getting him into this runoff with their hundreds of thousands of dollars of teacher union money. They've put $930,000 into the election so far. Um, most of his money, 95% of his money has come from unions in Chicago. Um, he is against school choice. He is also, when you talk about taxes, in favor of this a tax the rich um, plan that would really pummel Chicago, not just individuals, but businesses. And so, you know, you're right. Be careful what you wish for. This was a referendum on Lori Lightfoot and these and these policies, but yet one of the choices that Chicagoans have coming up is even more progressive and would potentially bring even more harm to the city of Chicago. Yeah, I saw Jan Johnson in a in a short video clip uh, talking about socialism and, you know, quote unquote, <laughs> baby socialists just wear the pins, but we've got to be full on grown up socialists. Um, socialism never helps anybody. Uh, no matter what anyone says, you're not going to convince me otherwise. And we've got history to prove it. Miley, education, you mentioned this is this is so big nationwide right now because every school suffered during the covid shutdowns. We see the numbers in Baltimore, which are just depressing. And Chicago doesn't look to be faring much better than Baltimore. I'm just That's wondering. <laughs> Is is it important enough to Chicagoans, their kids, to get up to speed as close as they can to to get reading proficiency, math proficiency, that they will turn to someone who says, yes, I'm going to empower you to choose whatever school you want? Or are they going to rely on that Democratic, you know, th that hook that they always use? If you want good schools, you vote Democrat. All the teachers are Democrats, da, 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 which it has failed again and again. So I really do think that school choice could make a difference in this election. Um, 60, in the same poll that we did with Echelon Insights, 62% of Chicagoans were in favor of school choice. So it is an issue that's very important to Chicagoans. And I do think between the pandemic and other things that have been scandals within Chicago Teachers Union, it is coming to light that Chicago Teachers Union, whether it is doing politics on the job, whether it is their mismanagement of the money, whether it is keeping kids out of school following the pandemic, parents have been made aware of the power that Chicago Teachers Union has over their daily lives. And, um, you know, I'm not really sure that having Chicago Teachers Union connected with Brandon Johnson is going to be... Um, a benefit for him because people are becoming aware of that power. Um, and even following just this election this week, there are questions in mainstream media. Is CTU the new Chicago machine? Um, and that's definitely a pejorative look at what Chicago Teachers Union is, what it has become. Um, and they are under fire, even within their membership right now, for funding his campaign and doing so without getting members okay. Oh my goodness. I mean, if I'm a teacher and I'm in that union and you're funding a candidate I don't align with, I, 
I'm going to be very angry. So that's an interesting development. And again, the, the, the machine in Chicago, Miley, I got to believe it's tough to keep up with the amount of corruption and the tentacles of it through Chicago. And then I, I would guess that permeates into to the rest of Illinois. But it just seems like there's this reputation in Chicago of dirty, corrupt politics. And I, I'm one of these people that wonders, can David beat Goliath? Can can this ever actually turn? And clearly, you're on that mission. What gives you inspiration and faith that the mission can pay off? I would point to the downfall of Michael Madigan. Michael Madigan was Speaker of the House in Illinois for decades, and he was not a household name. He was not someone that people downstate in particular knew anything about, really even outside of his district. His district loved him because he did things for the district, but he had control over Illinois politics for decades. And Illinois Policy Institute, we actually did a documentary on Michael Madigan. And following that documentary, he did become a household name. We started talking about him, pointing out the corruption that was happening. And um, following that documentary and the publicity that he was getting, we saw his um, approval rate. I think it was somewhere, his disapproval rate, I think it was somewhere around 70%. Wow. I can't remember now exactly where it was, but people knew who he was. And shortly after that, his downfall came. Even Democrats within his party would not vote for him to be Speaker of the House. And now he's in the midst of a scandal. He's been indicted for corruption. Um, so I look to things like that in Illinois, where even the Democrats didn't want to support him anymore because his name became toxic. And I think that is something that we could see um, particularly, you know, you look at this election and I mentioned that these two candidates are diametrically opposed. Well, Vallis didn't even get into the runoff four years ago. He was kind of like an also ran. He didn't come even close to getting in the runoff. And now here he is, the front runner with around, I think it was 34 percent of the votes. It's still being counted. Um, and so, I, you know, it is kind of one of two paths that Chicago and Illinois could take with this runoff election. Crime is one of those things that is a national issue, obviously. And we've seen just spikes since 2020 and this move to defund the police. And it is so astonishing to me that this m works with anyone, that anyone could think it's a good idea to diminish law enforcement. And you just, in the last day or so had a female police officer in Chicago killed when responding to a, a domestic violence case. And they want to just send you know, social workers to these cases. Come on. It, it, and that's not what the people of Chicago want either. In the same polling that we did, it was broad polling. It, it revealed that more than half want to see more police officers on the streets, which again is something that, you know, is that is it going to be known this election where these candidates fall? Um, it's it's an election that will be for the soul of of Chicago and and what happens on the streets, what happens in the schools. What, what are you experiencing there in terms of people leaving Chicago? I, I I can only speak anecdotally, and that doesn't that doesn't make any you know statement when you just talk anecdotes. But I've read about people and why they decided to leave, and it was it, a lot of it had to do with Lori Lightfoot. I've seen other people just leave because. The two reasons you cited, crime and taxes, right at the top. Is there a a, a significant exodus? Is it and do, do they go into the rest of Illinois or do they leave the state altogether? It, it, not necessarily into the, there is a significant exodus. There is a significant exodus from Illinois and there are more people leaving the state than are coming back in. Um, and, and in addition to the people leaving, we are seeing businesses yeah, leaving. Yeah. Caterpillar, just in the last year, Caterpillar is moving its headquarters. Boeing is leaving the state. Citadel is leaving the state. They're going to Florida. Um, Tyson Foods is moving Oh, I think like a thousand of their upper management employees or management employees out. So we have this exodus of businesses. And what are people and businesses citing? They're citing the poor business climate. They're citing the high taxes. Um, and, and some of these businesses have been citing crime yeah. as well. 
you're exactly right. Those are the overarching issues and it is driving people out of Illinois and businesses to states that are more business friendly. And it, so it would seem to me that if you're a politician in Illinois and, and specifically in Chicago, you would say to yourself, huh, that's not a good thing. How do we keep these business people happy here? How do we change the climate so they want to stay? Why doesn't that, why isn't that as obvious to politicians as it is to me? Or are they so married to their ideology that they can't see past it? I don't know that it's that they're as married to their ideology as much as it is, you know, I talked about the machine politics. The big player in Illinois is the government unions. And I want to make a distinction between the private sector unions and the government unions. With the government unions, we're talking about state workers, government workers, um, and the teachers unions. Okay. They are major players within the state of Illinois. Chicago Teachers Union itself in the last 12 years has funneled more than $17 million into the coffers of candidate committees. Half of our General Assembly has been funded by Chicago Teachers Jeez. Union. Two out of three, um, two out of three Chicago aldermen has been funded by Chicago Teachers Union. Um, and that's just one union. SEIU, AFSCME Council 31, they funnel millions of dollars into politics. It's something that many of their members don't know. And it is driving decisions. It's driving the politics in Illinois. And we've got a president in the White House who is very pro-union, and, and I'm not anti-union um, necessarily, but it's how each union conducts itself and does it represent its members. And it sounds to me like you're saying that, uh, particularly with the teachers union and maybe others, they're not representing their members. They're, they're taking their membership dues and they're saying, thank you very much. You've chosen me to represent you. And now I'm going to spend the money as I see fit. Exactly. We look at the unions, the government unions, um, filings every year. They have to file something with the federal government called an LM2. And they, even according to their own accounting, spend very little on representing their members. It's, it's one of the line items. So, for example, Chicago um, Teachers Union has admitted only 19% of their spending last year was on representational activities. So that's representing teachers in contract negotiations and administering the contract and grievances. Only 19% of their spending was on that. Basically one out of every $5 was spent for yeah. doing the job that yeah. they're really yeah. supposed to be doing. Yeah. So it was, you know, it's something that demonstrates that's not their priority. You know, it should be the core purpose of the union of these government unions is to be representing their members. That's not where they're putting their money. Um, and we do see an exodus of workers, government workers from their unions because of that. Um, we have seen, I think it's nine percent of teachers have left their unions since 2017. Can they do that and still teach? They can do that and still teach. Any government, um, state or local government worker in the nation can leave their union and maintain their job and pay no fees. It was a, a, a decision by the Supreme Court in 2018, which was called Janus versus I, AFSCME. Yes, I recall they, now, yes. They can leave their union and they've been exercising that right because they're not happy with their union. And we hear from hundreds of teachers every year. One of the things that they talk about is they don't like the way that their state affiliate and their national affiliate is spending money on politics. They might like their local union. Unfortunately, you can't stay in the local union um, and not be a part of those other entities. Got and it. they don't like the way those entities are placing politics above teachers, above other government workers. So I just want to clarify again for my own edification here and for our listeners that if you are in a teacher's union or any other public union, you don't, it's not required to be in that union right. for you to continue to work in your job, but you will yes. still now. It, so then let's say the union then negotiates benefits for its members. Are, are you as a teacher in that commensurate job still entitled to those you are. Okay. You are entitled to all those benefits. Why? Yeah, I, I, I can imagine people would be just leaving the unions in droves if they don't agree with the politics. But, uh, you know, I, I don't know. Is, is, is it in droves or is this a trickle right now? I would say 
a little bit of both. And it depends on the union and it depends on what the union is doing. Um, it ebbs and flows. Um, part of the reason that, let's say, teachers are maybe afraid to leave their union is because there is such a culture yeah. of the union being a part of their everyday yeah. life. And they and the teachers know who is or who is not. We did a documentary on Chicago Teachers Union, which is at chicagoteachersunion.com. And one of the people that we talked to is, um, her name is Ifoma Nkemdi. And she is a teacher within Chicago Public Schools. And she talks about crossing the picket line in 2019 because she needed to be at work for her kids. She needed to be at work to sustain herself. And um, she was, she feared for her life is what she says in the documentary because she was harassed to such an extent as she was going into the building. And so while many teachers or other government workers know that they can leave their union, the union is in a position and, and, and some of their leadership is in a position of being able to bully people, I think, into fearing leaving the union and exercising their constitutional rights. And that just ought to tick everybody off. I mean, really, that that should I, I, I would like want to form a union of the non-union members, <laughs> just or at least a little club, you know, to get together and support one another. Yeah. yeah, and I think that that does happen behind the scenes, and we do also help teachers and other government workers get in touch with other people who have opted out of their unions um, to make sure that they know that they're not alone, and they really aren't alone. Um, Thirty-eight thousand government workers in total have left their union since 2017. That's a lot of government workers. So they really aren't alone. It's just that they're, you know, some of them are more afraid to, to speak out. And I really have to give um, a lot of credit to teachers like Ifoma and Joe O'Cool, who is in our documentary for standing up for what's right and speaking out and letting people know what their rights are. It's going to take courageous individuals like that to continue to stand up and inspire others to stand up to make the necessary change. I never really thought I'd be talking about survival food. And really, what, what do we mean by survival food? It's stuff that you can keep in your cupboard, your pantry, your basement that'll last for years and years in case something really awful happens. And we've seen some really awful things happen in America in the last several years. So this may be something you want to do. You can create a little stockpile of your own of the best-selling four Patriot survival food kits. Now, this isn't ordinary food. We're talking about good for 25 years, super food, super survival food. It's hand-packed right in a family-owned facility in the USA and giving jobs to over 200 Americans. They have different delicious breakfasts, lunches, and dinners. They, you can make them in less than 20 minutes, and you can store these things. Look, they're, they're stackable. They're water-resistant. They're sturdy. They're compact. Right now, you can go to fourpatriots.com and use code Michelle to get 10% off your first purchase on anything in the store, including this three-month survival kit. You'll get their famous year-long guarantee after your order, plus free shipping on orders over 97 bucks. And they're called Four Patriots because a portion of every sale is donated to charities who support our vets and their families. Yay. Just go to fourpatriots.com, use code Michelle, M-I-C-H-E-L-E, just one L to get 10% off. That's the number four patriots.com code Michelle and start building your backup plan today. So I wonder about what you said a minute ago, bullying and people being afraid to take a different path. And here you are really standing up for Illinois, for Chicagoans, for what is right how is your life in general? How much fear do you experience personally? I I really don't. I I don't personally experience fear, but we do see backlash in other forms. We've gotten a lot of hate mail <laughs> at our office. Um, we've been blocked. CTU Chicago Teachers Union has blocked us on Twitter. Oh dear. Um, so <laughs> yes, I know. So, you know, it, it's things like that that happen. But in terms of like physical safety, um, I don't really feel any fear for that. But um, it's it's really more the people who and, and physical safety isn't necessarily um, something that I think even the teachers or government workers feel. It's it's more just 
being outside, being the outsider that they feel, um, being left out, not knowing what's going on within their union because the union becomes secretive and and feeling that, I guess, social pressure. Yeah. Um, that's really what a lot of it comes down to. Great anecdote I read. And again, anecdotes are just that. They're just stories, but a, a, of a, a guy who grew up in Chicago, loved Chicago, figured he'd die in Chicago. Just that rooted, his whole entire family rooted. And one year, his father decided he was not going to vote Democrat. He's going to vote Republican. And I guess shortly after the election, uh, his trash cans went missing. And so they replaced the trash cans and those went missing. And they replaced them again and those went missing. And it went on and on and until finally after the next election, when he voted Democrat again, he never lost his trash cans again. I mean, it's a- almost hard to believe that something like that could happen. Um, is does that does that little story surprise you at all? <laughs> It doesn't, but I don't know that that's a Chicago thing more than any other, you know, neighbors can be persnickety anywhere. (laughs) So (laughs) I don't, I don't know that that's necessarily a Chicago thing. Um, I I think you hear more about it in Chicago. People are a little more angry if you, you move their um, parking space markers before a snowstorm. (laughs) Oh, well, yeah, that would make me angry too. I can, (laughs) that's one I can relate to here at living in Minnesota. And, you know, I think it's important to talk about cities like Chicago and states like Illinois, where people are like you are trying to make a difference and it can provide a blueprint for other states that are trending in that direction. I think Connecticut, I think California, which may be too, too far off the grid. Uh, I think of Minnesota, Um, you know, here in Minnesota, I think of New York, which almost saw Lee Zeldin get elected as its governor. Gubernatorial politics in Illinois. Do they mirror what we see in Chicago? Are they reflective of that? Or is it a little bit different at the state level? I I think it does mirror what is happening in Chicago. When you look at the number, and and part of that just comes down to numbers, right? Like there are a lot more um, representatives and senators in our state legislature from the Chicago area than there are downstate. So that's part of it. Um, But you're exactly right. What happens in Chicago, what happens in Illinois tends to be a blueprint for other places. And I I, I know I keep coming back to Chicago Teachers Union, but they have been in the news here lately. They are a major political player. And one of the reasons we did the documentary on Chicago Teachers Union is as a warning to other places. What happens when a teachers union or a government union becomes so politically active Mm -hmm that it is devastating to a school district. Because we know Chicago Teachers Union prides itself on being that um, example to other unions. After their 2012 strike, they went out and they did town halls. They they um, have a an article on their website that was done by Vox um, that talks about how they were spreading the new gospel after that teachers strike on getting things on the table that are not normally on the table during negotiations. And and we know it's a blueprint for other places. CTU prides itself on triggering strikes in other states from Arizona to West Virginia following their 2012 strikes. So we know that they hold themselves out as the example. They go to others and say, look, this is how it should be done. Um, And it is something that could come to another state if those states aren't careful and and watchful of what's going on with their unions. Uh, Even on a national level, for some reason, education has become this, I I almost look at it as a wolf in sheep's clothing. Like Randy Weingarten to me is (laughs) a ridiculous representative of teachers. Ridiculous. And she is such a political animal that it's not even, she's not even hiding it. I mean, it, she's screaming for stuff. And, and then in LA, when they wanted to come back from COVID, they wanted teachers to get back in the classroom, the demands they made from the LA teachers union, most of them had little to do with COVID. It was like, we want the police to be defunded. We want this to happen. I mean, it's like, what in the hell your teachers teach our kids. And I think the other part of it is, and, and because we're focusing a little more on education here, People during COVID, we always say this was maybe a silver lining, that parents saw what was going on, that they weren't just getting their kids reading, writing, arithmetic, 
that other stuff was happening in there. And some of these teachers were bringing ideas into the classroom that really aren't their place to bring into the classroom. So I, I feel like for the first time, maybe in my life, education is a much bigger issue nationwide in different localities than it ever has been. And the problem I sense for, for part of this is that like here in Minnesota, they paint the teachers union as this warm and fuzzy and we care about your kids and let's make it the best future for our kids and let's fully fund. This is another phrase right now, fully fund education. I'm not even sure what that means. What does fully fund mean? What are the parameters of being fully funded? It's just a term that they're throwing out there. Let's fully fund education to suggest that we haven't been funding education to the extent that it needs to be. We need more money. And I'm not sure that that's necessarily the answer. And so, you know, I, I who I've, as a daughter of a public school teacher, I really have a tough time watching all of this and knowing that these unions are sort of presenting themselves as the, 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 we know what's best for your kids and we need all the money in the world to get it done and just shut up and let us do our job. Yeah, we, we definitely see that here in Illinois, um, the calls for more funding. We looked back to 2010. So in, in 2010, a more militant, politically active caucus of leadership took over Chicago Teachers Union. It's called CORE, the Caucus of Rank and File Educators. CORE took over in 2010. So we looked back to see what has happened with enrollment, with proficiency, with absenteeism since they took over. And what we found is very concerning. So first of all, enrollment has sunk in Chicago public schools since CORE took over, nearly 90,000 students. So they lost about, between then and now, about 20% of their students, yet they are spending, Chicago public schools is spending 55% more. So spending has ballooned on fewer students. So you really can't look to funding to say, oh, we need more funding. They're actually able to spend more on fewer students and they average something like $28,000 a year per student in Chicago public schools. That's not what is going on. Um, proficiency then, we looked at that, has dropped since CORE took over. Last year, only 80 percent, I'm sorry, last year, 11th graders, 80 percent could not read or do math at grade level. And similarly for eighth, third through eighth grade students, 80% could not do math at grade level, 80% 80, 80 couldn't do reading at grade level, 85% couldn't do math at grade level. So we have seen that and we attracted it, that drop since 2010 when CORE took over um, and, and absenteeism as well. And part of this is the pandemic, um, but at about half of Chicago public school students were chronically absent last year. That is an abysmal um, percentage. And so much of this has happened, like I said, since Chicago Teachers Union became even more militant and more politically active. They have since then been putting politics above students and politics above their members. Strikes have become their go-to mechanism to get their demands met five times since 2010. Um, there hadn't been a strike for 25 years before they went on strike in 2012. And, you know, I, I'm a mom of three students, of three kids, and um, I look at that and I think, well, what is that teaching kids? Um, even just that alone, that the teachers union is so willing to walk out yeah. to get what they want. Yeah. School's not, school doesn't appear to be important. No. Um, so why would you go to school yourself? Right. If you're walking out on the kids, the kids are feeling Okay. I, yeah, I, that's got to You're right. That message it sends to kids is, is detrimental to say the least. I am massively concerned about this because our future, you know, the kids are the future. I know it sounds dorky, but it's the truth. We were all yes. once kids. We were all raised a certain way. And please don't tell me that the standards need to be lowered in order to educate our kids. No, 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 no. You're telling them kids that they aren't capable and they are, they have agency, they have power, they have, you can teach them that they can make up their minds to excel and, and we're teaching them quite the opposite. And it's, it's, um, 
I, I'm really concerned about what this is doing to kids individually, to families, to the trajectory of that family. You know, is that kid going to be able to go on and succeed in life to have the skills? Uh, it, it's just, I, I, I'm actually quite angry about it. And Miley, I'm, I'm grateful that there are people like you that are trying so hard to do something about it. And I, I wish you nothing but success. Thank you very much. Folks, um, this again, I, I, I try to amplify voices that are doing the things that need to be done these days to help us stay, to get back on track. Cause we're staying on track as in the past, we need to get back on track. So like Miley, please be brave, do good. And thanks for listening to Sideline Sanity. Sanity.